so we're going to get started. Hello everybody and thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to talk about how to have fun. That's pretty much what I want to share with you because this topic can be so scary. And I know um, I had to do a lot of these in my time when I was a TA. This was a really great way for me to make a little bit of money was to go to these beginner clinics in North Carolina and Georgia. And you have 20 to 35 beginner saxophonists all in one room in front of you. And they are exploding with energy and they're super excited or they're forced to be there by their parents. And you have to deal with that and you have to, you have to make it work, right? So how do you make it work? Because this can be so scary. So that's kind of the big reason why I wanted to do it. Um, so a little bit about me and my background and why um, I wanted to talk about this topic more. Um, I have a background teaching elementary music. So I spent a year teaching Montessori preschool music and I also taught a kindergarten through sixth grade general music. And that was when I was auditioning for grad schools. So I had a whole year of working with kids and um, just having fun and exploring the magical side of music. You know, kids get psyched to go to music class right up until they hit fourth grade, like from preschool to third grade. Music is this completely different world and they get to express themselves. And we hear that so much that students are always like, you know, music is where I found my people and it's where I felt the most comfortable. And that starts early. And I love that aspect of teaching music to kids is that it was so magical. And that always became a goal of mine in my classroom was how can I make this magical? So then I went to grad school and I was a TA through my master's and through my doctorate. And I was learning how to teach saxophone to older students. But through that process, through those six years, I found myself fusing together this elementary music ideas and methodologies with um, teaching older students and teaching saxophone and teaching musicality. And I still use some of these things even to teach my students. Um, you can ask them. I sometimes am like clapping at them like I would in a kindergarten class just because the transition works better. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my background and why I feel like this fusion really works well. And the other thing was, I just wanted to share this story with you. Um, back when I was doing a beginner clinic, uh, this was in Georgia, these are, beginner clinics are huge. So like I mentioned before, you go to a school and there are about 20 to 35 sixth graders or fifth graders, depending on what age the school starts them, in front of you. They've been given their instrument and that's it. They haven't been told anything else to do and it's all on you. And so I went and I did this clinic and I had an absolute blast. I just loved it. I had so much fun. Kids are having fun, there was laughs, the parents were all in the room too, and they were laughing, and, and they all left the room playing an easy tune. It was great, and it was just a small cherry on top that I got a small paycheck with it too. Um, so I was driving home with my friend who went with me to teach a different instrument, and he just had the exact opposite experience. He hated it, and this, my friend is an accomplished musician, has multiple degrees, on his horn and he just had the worst time and he kept complaining about the kids wouldn't listen and the kids um, were doing this and the kids were over here doing this and yeah, they got through the instrument and they learned some things, but it was just a nightmare for him. And it just kind of clicked in my head that this stuff is not naturally in our brains. The, these ideas, these how to teach these concepts, like. Every one of you here today know how to put the horn together. Every one of you know how to practice long tones, how to play a B. But can you connect that knowledge to a student who has no previous experience holding this foreign object, which can be very awkward and you have to put something around your neck and to hold it there. And there's these buttons and there's these buttons in here and there's these buttons in here. And oh my gosh, it can just overwhelm kids. So. 
um, this is a skill that you have to practice and you have to cultivate and you have to see it done a lot. And so I just wanted to kind of give you like a rundown of what I do. So I have some, some phrases and some goals that I really like to tell my students when I'm teaching them how to teach. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen with you and I'm going to talk through this. Okay, so engaging the beginners in a classroom setting, as I said. And this is all about how to do it and have fun. Like, this is cool. You are going to have fun and they are going to have fun. So four phrases for success. These are the four things I want you to remember as you're putting together your beginning lesson, lesson plan. <laughs> so make it fun. That's obvious, right? Because that's my goal for this whole presentation. You need to go into it with the attitude that it is fun. It is exciting, right? If you go into it and you are talking to them and you're not smiling, you're just like, okay, so I'm going to teach you how to play the saxophone now. And you're going to play some notes and here we go. Like, they're going to tune out really quick. That's not fun, right? You have to be engaging. You should be yourself, but you need to find... Um, even if you're not a high energy person or a bubbly person, you need to find that enthusiasm for the horn, right? Because you're doing this because you love it. So you just share that love. Okay, so you have to have that energy. Create games. You can turn any learning opportunity into a game. You can turn um, playing just one note or learning articulation or learning fingering into a game. And um, what I'm going to do is walk you through my beginner lesson plan that I have in mind created for when I'm in a large group doing this. And I have little games sprinkled in there, so we'll talk through some of those as well. Keep it simple. I teach instrument, instrumental pedagogy at UNLV and one of the assignments that the students have to do is write a beginner lesson plan and then they have to say it and demonstrate it for the class. They can bring in a student to act like a beginner um, or they can just say it out loud and pretend the beginner's next to them. And every single time I always have to tell them to cut things out, cut this information out, cut this information out. It's too much. You want to give the students just enough information to get them through putting the horn together, being able to play a little bit. They don't need to know the intricacies of reed strings at this point or where to buy the reeds. Put it in a packet, hand it out, okay? That should have been the phrase, put it in a packet. <laughs> but on top of that, keep your direction simple to the kids. I'm sure you've all heard um, the, this exercise in your bands when the graduate conducting person gets up there and the director says give them a direction less than five words okay so like try that for yourself see how simple you can make the direction too many words kids tune out this is my favorite one controlled chaos so you are going to have the students doing very specific tasks and you need them to stay engaged and you need them to stay with you and they can't just get up and go crazy that's not what this is so there's about you'll see there's about 10 minutes of directions the kids have to follow in the beginning of this and then you have to let them explode a bit right they have so much energy so much enthusiasm that you have to give them a couple opportunities to just go Whoa! okay and then you pull them back in and you start giving more directions you start teaching them more things. So you'll see this through my lesson plan, the moments of controlled chaos. Oh, just to go back, if anyone's curious, this picture is from when I was giving a talk to an elementary school class about the saxophone. And if you're wondering what I'm doing, um, I was explaining to them that the reed vibrates when you play. And a uh, fun little thing, if you didn't know this, if you um, if you put your mouth on the, the end of the neck and you suck in, there, you can actually see the reed move up and down really fast on the corner. So that's what I was showing the kids right there. 
Okay. To have the most successful experience or to make sure the kids have the most successful, successful first experience teaching the horn, these are the things I recommend you bring with you. Okay. Obviously your saxophone, because you will be demonstrating for them throughout the whole thing. But then also mouthpiece patches, lots and lots enough for everyone. Now I know you may not want to spend your money buying mouthpiece patches for other kids. You can ask the band director ahead of time. Hey, can you please have these available for the kids or put them on their mouthpiece before they come to this? I have done that and I have found that the band director has too much to think about and it doesn't happen most of the time. So I have just taken it on myself. I just bring mouthpiece patches. I just do it. I give it to the kids. I don't charge them. Trying to charge them in the heat of trying to teach a big group, bad idea. Don't do that. I would just recommend bring the patches. Be willing to give them out. Core grease. Please bring core grease. Bring a couple tubes. Send it around the room. Have the kids put a few strips of cork grease on their cork because a lot of the corks are dried out. Use horns. You just don't know what you're getting. So you want to be prepared to help the students adjust the horns so it will be easy for them to put the parts together. And the bottom two are just if you have them. If you don't, don't worry about it. But sometimes a kid will come in without an extra. Sometimes they're going to come in with a chip mouthpiece because it's their uncle's from like 40 years ago, but the uncle said they could have it and it's chipped and it's not going to work. So if you have some stock mouthpieces just lying around um, in your office or in your apartment, bring them with. You don't have to give those out. I would keep those, like get them at the end or be willing to sell them for cheap. But just think of things you can bring to make it more successful. To, not, to make sure no kid falls behind because they had forgotten to bring one of these things or they weren't set up properly. Okay, so now the goal. We're gonna get the student to play a melody by the time they leave, which seems like a lot because to get there, you have to think about all of this, all of it. And just looking at all the things you need to get, you need to think about and you need to have the student think about just my anxiety starts rising immediately, okay? So don't, don't fall into this trap of getting overwhelmed. Look to the very bottom, how to have fun while learning this amazing instrument, okay? That's it, that's, that's the main goal. If they can leave playing the melody that you've chosen for them, that's kind of icing on top and the parents love that they can play a tune right away, right? But if they had fun learning, that's key. That's what I want you to focus on. And if you have that goal in your mind, everything else is going to be a lot easier. Okay, before putting the saxophone together, there's so much you have to talk about <laughs> before you even get to this task. So most kids, I always ask them, I try and make it as interactive as possible. And I go, okay, what do you think we're gonna do first? And they're always like, let's put it together. And I'm like, wait a second. We have more to discuss. Opening the case correctly, okay? You have to, you have to teach them how to open the case because if they open it upside down, then the horn falls out. Also, you need to be sure that the case is on the ground, okay? So many kids are going to pick up the case and put it on their lap. They open it and all of a sudden something tumbles out. You want to take away the potential energy, okay? Don't let it be an option that something can fall on the ground and break. Put the case on the ground and then show them which side is up. And you can get stickers to do this. You don't need to get stickers, but stickers are fun and kids do love them, so consider that. Um, the other thing though is a lot of cases will have their logo on the top or you, you need to find something on each case that the kid can have a marker in their mind. Okay, I need to be able to see this part of the case when I set it on the ground before I open it. And each case is different. So take the time to walk around the classroom. Just spend that moment. Don't let the kid, this isn't a free for all. This is very important. Um, whenever you walk around the room, 
to check on something. This is not a time for them to talk and it's a free for all. You need to have them focused on their task at hand and it is okay to ask them to be silent during this time. Okay, so stickers can help you. And then you have them open the case. But before you do that, I would definitely preface it with do not touch anything inside the case once you open it, okay? This seems like you're really controlling every single facet of what they're doing, and you are, but this control gives them something to do. If you just say open the case and all of a sudden it's grab, 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 throw, drop, break, and then they're a sad little saxophonist, okay? So you're doing this for them. Don't feel bad about giving them a lot of instructions, okay? So before you open the case, tell them, do not touch anything inside. We are just opening it and we are gazing, okay? So you can all open it together and go, whoa, pretty, okay? You're experiencing the magic together. So then the next thing you do before you put it together, you have to know the names of the parts of the horn. So this is where I usually hold up each part individually and I say the name out loud. So I would hold up the neck and go, this is called the neck. And have them repeat after me if you want. Um, yeah, and then you put it down and you move on to the next thing. Once you've gone through all the different parts of the horn, you want to ingrain that in their brain, okay? Saying it once isn't enough. All the things that you were telling them, you are going to have to find a way to repeat it in a fun and engaging way. So you come up with a game, okay? So you hold up the part as a group. One, two, three, tell me the name. One, two, three, neck. Yes, awesome, you guys are great. Or you can hold up the part and go, okay, I'm gonna point to someone and they have to tell me the name of this. So during this pause, they're all thinking, what's the name of that? What's the name of that? Their minds are still all engaged. And then you point to someone and then they have to say, it's the neck. Yay, and you can have them give a round of applause, get the kids excited about everyone else succeeding as well. Or you can have a student hold up one of their parts very carefully. Everyone look at that student. What are they holding up? They're holding up a neck. Yes, okay. So you come up with just different ways to get them to say the names of all the parts of the instrument. Okay, so now we're going to move to actually, actually putting parts of the horn together. Um, it's a little prep right here though. Yes, so this part, put reed in mouth and there's a bonus right there. Can anyone guess what the bonus is of the reed in mouth of the kids? They cannot speak. Not very well at least. Um, that would take some real finagling to read over here. Their mouths are a little smaller. So read in mouth means they cannot talk, which can be a, a positive for you if you have some chatty kids in there. So get them to put the read in the mouth and then you can move on to some other things. Put the neck strap on. Okay, here is where I would have them hold their mouthpiece up and if they don't have a patch, I go around and I put it on for them. That way it's in the right spot. That way they have a mouthpiece patch and this helps when forming correct embouchure so much. Um, one note about the mouthpiece patches, I know uh, they can be a little expensive. Um, I, I remember this a while back. There's someone who makes mouthpiece patches out of electrical tape, I believe. I think it's Elizabeth Rosenblum who's giving a talk later this week, but you can talk to her about that. I'm pretty sure it's her, Elizabeth, if it's you, shout out, because I did that for a few years too. Anyways, um, getting back to it. So once you put the mouthpiece patch on the mouthpiece, have them set the mouthpiece down because you want them to pick up their neck so you can add the cork grease to it, okay? These components all in place will make it very easy to put the two together. So now you have the student pick up the mouthpiece and the neck and gently twist it on. You're gonna have some students who are scared to push because it's a little difficult and you've gotta walk around and help them. You try and make sure they all put it on kind of to the same spot. And also, I know you're probably wondering why we're not putting the full mouthpiece ligature reed together. So reed's in the mouth. If we had the ligature on and then the reed, so then they have to grab the mouthpiece with the ligature and reed on and then put it on the neck. But there, I've seen ligatures just 
fall apart at that point, and then you have to walk around again. So this is simpler. Uh, mouthpiece, neck, foot together. Okay, and then, let's see. So, let me just demonstrate this kind of real quick. So reeds in mouth, but I need to talk, so I'm gonna keep it out. You have just put the mouthpiece, you twisted it gently onto the neck. This also makes it a little easier to hold on to. So the next thing you do is put the ligature on. Okay? Now, inadvertently, you will see a student with reed put on the mouth, put place it next to the mouthpiece, and then put the ligature on. But why do we say no to that, everybody? Because you will chip the reed and you will be a sad little saxophonist, okay? So you have to you have to get good at remembering to put the ligature on first and then sliding the reed on without touching the tip and conveying that to your students over and over and over again, okay? You do not want any sad saxophonists in this. Everyone is happy, everyone's having a good time. And be sure, um, I love this, uh, just mention the ligatures that these students will have will have the screws on the right side, okay? So they can check that. Screws, this is my right hand. It's on the right side. It's on the left side. They flipped it and it's on the wrong way. So you have to walk around and make sure everyone has that. Oops, sorry to talk about this. Okay, so I'm gonna demonstrate this real quick. So I have my saxophone in my saxophone case right here. We've already had the neck strap on. We have this part together. And what I've written here, have student lean over and stand saxophone up in case. So what that means, Stand it up in the case, okay? And then put it together, right here. And then take your hook, hook it there, and then bring it up, okay? You don't want them to pick up the body and then try to hook it on their lap. Normally this would be on the floor, but I brought it up here so you all can see. And then it's all together, okay? So that's what I mean by stand the sax one up in the case. It's still like sitting in there. The weight of it is right there. You hook it and then pick it up. What are we gonna do next? I always ask the kids this. So we have the horn together. We are right here. What do you think they say? They all say, oh, we're gonna play, we're gonna play. And I go, no, <laughs> we're gonna take the horn apart. And here's my reasoning for this, okay? Don't hate me. Um, I'm sure many of you wear contacts, and I wanna take you back to your very first appointment when you went in and got fitted for contacts, and you had to sit there and put the contacts in, and then they wouldn't let you leave the office until you could demonstrate taking the contacts out. I had to do this, and I sat there for 45 minutes. So that's what I equate this to. I wanna be sure that the student knows how to take this instrument apart correctly. And they get more practice if I make them do it right now because we're gonna have to put the horn together again and then take it apart at the very end. So they're getting, you're giving them more opportunity, okay? You're not taking anything away from them. So, just very quickly, have students set saxophone down in case, unhook from neck strap, okay? So set it down, why am I unhooked at seven? Set it down and then unhook, okay? Very important. Remove the neck from the body, set body down in case. I'm just gonna read through this without doing it because I'm gonna play. Remove ligature, place read in mouth, and place ligature in case, twist mouthpiece off neck, and place both in case. Okay, you can teach them how to clean the horn at this point too. So all components have been in the put in the case and they can pick up the body by itself. They can pick up the neck by itself and you can teach them how to swab it. Small note about the swabs, every single beginner clinic I have been to, the students have not had the correct swabs. They have this like cleaning kit with all the, the really um, harsh brushes that can scratch the inside of the mouthpiece and scratch. Um, and I make a note, and if the parents are in there, I always say, hey, this case, this little cleaning set right here, you don't want to use this. Um, and so I always, I always show my swab, which I believe is actually a clarinet gem swab, but I like it because the bottom is like coated, okay? 
so you, you're not going to scratch anything. And it's long, and it cleans great. I don't like the bristly brushes. Okay, so now you're going to reassemble the saxophone, but in stages, so that way you can start teaching them how to play, okay? So assemble, repeat steps to assemble mouthpiece, neck, ligature, and reed. Okay, so let me take this apart so you can see where we're at. So here's where you've gotten students to again. So they get all that practice putting this together, and I usually have them say the steps out loud. So I'll say, what's the first thing we do? Put your neck strap on. What's the second thing we do? Okay. Talk through it. You're giving them opportunity to recall. You're letting them input all this information in their brain. Oops, sorry. Okay. So we've gotten to this point. And now this is why I start talking about embouchure. Now everyone talks about this stuff a little differently or everyone has their own little tools on how they talk through this. And what I like to do, this is what works for me, but if it gives you any ideas, then that's great. And if you wanna discuss these, I'm happy to at the end. I like to start with placing top teeth on the mouthpiece. Okay, I know a lot of people will say, we'll talk about rolling the bottom lip first, but I, find that the students bite less if I start with the top teeth and I really get that anchor point of your body to the saxophone happening right there. So top teeth on the mouthpiece and this is why you needed the mouthpiece patches. So the vibrations don't play with their teeth and they can actually sit there. Otherwise their teeth are going to slip around on the mouthpiece and we don't want that. So top teeth on the mouthpiece. And the thing that you can mention is that you put your teeth on, you can walk around and show them where your teeth marks are. They really like seeing like what's going on with the teacher stuff. Or you can also say it's where the reed meets the mouthpiece. You can get a little business card and put it in there and see where it stops. So my former teacher did. Um, I think with beginners, they, their hands may be uncoordinated, not coordinated enough to get that to happen, but you can just kind of show them like where to put their teeth. So I always have this idea, okay? So they should be able to move the mouthpiece and their teeth stay exactly where they are. No slipping, okay? Sometimes I like to use the analogy of um, the weight. Well, it's not an analogy, but I say the weight of your head is on this mouthpiece. Does anyone know how much the human head weighs? I think it's between eight and 12 pounds, someone can correct me later. But the weight of your head, right there, okay? Right there. And then from there, and I put it, make them put the mouthpiece in their mouth as they say this. They say, uh, ooh, ee, ooh. And that gets their corners coming forward. And I like the E because it kind of gets their tongue a little high too. You, otherwise, you're going to have them down here, and you don't want that. And I try not to talk too much technical about this, about your oral cavity, because I think I lose them most of the time when that, when those words come out. So just get them saying the vowels. E, and then for the bottom lip, this is, I'm always fascinated by talking about how people discuss the pressure here. So something that I've been playing around with recently is pull your bottom lip off the reed completely. All right. Oh. Uh, creating space right there and then return to just barely touching the reed okay you're not putting any pressure it's just you feel that your lip is touching the reed at that point and then gently push up until the corners of the mouth seal it's your teeth you shouldn't feel any pain that's what i tell them you should not feel any pain from your teeth so off touching and then up until corner seal and I feel like that gets them to not bite. And that's, that's what I see every time I get a new student is they're usually biting. So anything you can do to get them to not be biting, go for it. Ha, ah, this is my favorite part. <laughs> the slide whistle and duck call. And I'm sure most of you know this, but I will demonstrate this for you. Okay, so the slide whistle is when you play on this, and you make the tube longer, or you can put your finger in there and change the pitch. Sorry about that squeak. 
Kids love that, okay? You're giving them something they can do immediately, right? And this is after you've talked about the embouchure and kind of set it there. So this is like their first like sound going. So I demonstrate that and then they, they don't get to try it while I play it. This is our controlled chaos, okay? So they've been so good, just like all of you have been listening to me right now. They have been so good at following directions and not talking to their neighbor and not doing anything wrong that you need to let them just kind of, oh, just get the energy out, get the excitement out for five seconds. So I say, okay, for five seconds, you get to make any sound you want on this. And I tell the parents to cover their ears because it's gonna be loud. Uh, ready, go. And I give them five seconds, literally. And I count it off and then stop. And it is silent, okay? So you're giving them an outlet to get that energy and enthusiasm just out of their bodies. You're going to do the same thing with the duck call. So I like to start with this one because you have the mouthpiece on the neck and it's just a little easier to manipulate and hold. Now you have them take the neck off. And this is so you can demonstrate mouthpiece pitch, right? I call it a duck call because kids are going to remember that more than mouthpiece pitch or they'll help them connect to the term mouthpiece pitch. Okay, so demonstrate duck call. I go with a concert A for me, so that's what I have the students um, reach for. I don't spend a lot of time trying to really get them to get exactly an A. If they're getting close, what I'll do is walk around, I will meet their pitch, and then I will move to the A. And if they grasp that with their ears, then that's great, but I don't spend too much time. Um, but that's just some little troubleshooting right there. And then they get five seconds of controlled chaos again, okay? So right away, they're playing again. Yes, this is awesome. Five seconds, one, two, three, four, five, silence, okay? They're ready to like learn more things, okay? That energy has left their bodies. And then I play a little game because I love games. So um, there's so many different ways that you can do this or play these games as I demonstrated before with, you know, you do something, the whole group does something. You do something, an individual does something. Individual does something, group does something. So for these, I like to point randomly at kids and then they have to be ready to play. And they don't have to like freak out and go like, <laughs> right? They can slowly do it. They can go, oh, point, right? It's just getting them to engage. They are constantly looking at me and they're ready to perform when I point to them. The other great part about this is it allows you the ability to see where everyone is at. You get to you get to analyze their progress and you can troubleshoot just a little bit. Now sometimes, and I have had this, where a student just can't make a sound right away. Nothing is coming out. And I try and spend about five to 10 seconds with them just troubleshooting it. If nothing comes out, I just very calmly tell them it is okay, keep trying. I will get you to make a sound at the end of this if you still have trouble. Don't worry, just stay after. And that is my solemn promise, I absolutely do that. So don't worry if someone's falling behind, just keep it fun, keep them engaged and keep, keep encouraging them. Okay, so after we've gotten to this point, this is where I talk about posture and playing position. So they only have the mouthpiece in their hand at this point, right? Ask them to put it down in their case, just down on the ground. And now you get to do a little breathing experiment to help explain why they need to sit up straight with good alignment. Okay, so. So you have the students flop over. Um, I don't know if you can see them do this, but you just have them like flop over onto their legs all of, as far down as they can go. And you have them take a deep breath, right? You can all do that right now if you would like. You know, usually in my uh, woodwind methods class, I teach sax I teach all the instruments by teaching the beginner lesson to the kids and really treating them like kids to try and bring the magic in. So like bringing the magic in through a screen is a new challenge, but I think, I think it's working. I feel magic right now. So if you want to try this, you just flop over all the way onto your leg. 
Take a deep breath in. It will feel restricted because you were flopped over and not sitting up tall. And then you have them sit straight up. And I, I like to say like, okay, I want you to sit up tall and let your chest just let it rise to the sky. Your shoulders are being pulled out to the opposite end and the crown of your head's being pulled up. And I like to talk about alignment a little more than like sitting up straight necessarily. And then take a deep breath in, let it out. <sighs> Kids, which one was easier? And of course they always say, the one where we're sitting up straight. Excellent. And this is why you sit up straight when you play the saxophone. This is why it's necessary. So it's not enough to say it sometimes. Sometimes you need to have them experience it. Then we talk about playing position. Okay, so have the student connect their horn back together. Okay, and then you demonstrate playing position and with kids at this age, they're usually going to be off to the side because they're small. Some kids will be able to do um, down the middle, but that's something you have to walk around and kind of help. And the other part of that is you're going to have to help them twist that mouthpiece so it's in the proper, so they don't have to do this, right? And so I let the kids try it first. So I say, okay, put the horn off to the side, turn the mouthpiece, you're sitting up straight, and inevitably I will get a student who's like this, and I come up to them and I mirror them. And I go, your neck looks like this right now. And so we fix them and we get them good playing position. Okay, yeah, walk around the room. Don't let them play. If you hear a honk, stop that, go, nope. We're not, we're not all ready to experience that magic yet, okay? Everyone, just playing position. And now we get to playing like the first note. We play on the neck, we play on the mouthpiece, and you're going to teach them notes. So I connect the notes to numbers because they know numbers, they drilled on numbers all day long in math class. So I have them hold up their left hand, they hold up one, their pointer finger, and I explain, they're going to press this finger down and blow air to play their first note, okay? So you are literally having them experience that physical push, okay? And then I demonstrate playing the note, have the whole group try it, and that's kind of like a five second chaos. I, go, go, I say, go ahead and try this, and I can hear, I can kind of analyze who's, having, who's struggling, who's, who's doing okay, I can see that. And then I do a little back and forth, so I will go, I will play, and then they play. And so at this point, this is when the pacing really starts picking up. So I'll be playing, and I try and kind of keep it to a pulse, or I at least will start snapping. Dun, dun, and I have them repeat after me. I'm just like, do exactly what I do, okay? And you notice, when I give direction at this point, I'm usually keeping tempo because they're more likely to keep paying attention if I keep a pulse going. That's straight up from first grade music. Okay, so I'll do that, I'll follow me. Ready, here's my turn, duh. Ready, your turn. Listen to me, Bum. Your turn, duh. A lot of that, a lot of back and forth, a lot of modeling, a lot of giving them opportunity to play, okay? Same thing for A, hold up your hand. Number two, B's finger, you're going to press down, okay? And then you repeat all those steps. They just have to play A, same thing. You will play an A, they will play an A. I usually keep a tempo going. It's not important that they play exactly on the tempo. It's just important they know the window of time that they are allowed to play, which is two or four beats. Same thing with G, okay? Hold up your fingers for three. Okay, put those fingers down. Sometimes if I'm hearing a lot of wrong notes, I will go, okay, everyone show me your fingers down for A, and I walk around the room real quick and scan and make sure that everyone has these two fingers down. Sometimes they have the palm keys pushed down and you gotta check that because that won't let the sound happen. Repeat the steps, right? Try and keep the pulse going, try and keep, try and keep the rhythm going. And this is where we add the tongue in. At least this is where I like to add the tongue in. I don't add it right away because I want them to have the air going continuously. 
We always say this in our lessons and we always hear it from our teachers, right? We need to keep the air consistent and the tongue just interrupts. And we all have our own analogies for that, right? It's a dam stopping water. It's a hose spigot stopping water coming out. Um, whatever you use, that's great. I just, I like to get the water going first before I actually add the dam to it. So I demonstrate with just air and tongue after explaining that the tongue interrupts the air stream. And I will usually say, uh, say two for me. Everyone say two, two, okay. I'll go two, 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 two. And I say that part of your tongue that touches the roof of your mouth when you're prepping for two, two, touch the reed, touch the tip of the reed with that part of your tongue. And then I let them kind of just explore that silently. They're not playing the notes at this point. And then I demonstrate playing the note, holding it, and then just using the tongue to interrupt to stop. Right? So, let's see. I'm going to bring my horn together. I know you guys all know this, but why not demonstrate for you guys? Okay, so I'll start with holding a note, and then my tongue will interrupt. <laughs> You can demonstrate with that air with air too. So have them practice it on just their air. I explain to them the air is continuous and is still there waiting to be shot out. And then demonstrate on your saxophone. And then have them try it. This is kind of a controlled chaos setting. And then you can set a tempo to it, right? So then you're going to set an actual rhythm and just have them repeat after you. They don't need to read any music at this point. They just need to hear what you're doing, which is articulating very easy rhythms, and they can repeat that. So going, okay, listen to what I'm doing. Your turn. Two. Ready. Go. Da. 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 And then my turn. Go. Your turn to ready, go, da, da. Okay, so set up that pulse, set up that just constant rhythm. So they're just, they're moving ahead, they're engaged. There's no, there's no time for them to pull their brain out of this, okay? They have to keep moving because you are constantly giving them things to do. Same thing with A, same thing with G. They're practicing easy articulation on each note. And then we connect the notes, okay? So we're connecting B, A, and G because that is the beginning of our melody that we want the students to get through. Uh, let's see, demonstrate playing B, A, and G as whole notes with breaks in between to move the fingers. Tongue returns to the reed during rest. So here's what I'm talking about. Again, it's super simple, but let's have a demonstration anyways. So I play B. And during this time of rest, my tongue returns to the reed, and I press A down. that twice and then I do it and then they do it and then we sometimes we all do it together I think it's important to give them space in between in the beginning to switch to move the fingers okay you can't just have them go bum, 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 right away give them time to think about it and then you can speed it up so from there I would move to doing half notes <laughs> turn to ready same thing da, da, da. sometimes if they're struggling with the notes so this is some troubleshooting if wrong notes are coming out I will hold up my fingers because I've already connected numbers to the notes so I can go one two switch into three three okay so 
connecting it the whole time we're going through this i encourage you be aware of what's working what's not if they're struggling with something if there are wrong notes don't be afraid to review that don't be afraid to go back okay this is about the student like be sure the student is getting this information it's not just about you expelling learning can happen without a teacher right a teacher is not necessary for learning so you need to make sure that you are being aware and being sure that you are doing everything you possible and considering every different way to get the student to learn from you okay now you have a game because let's have lots of games throughout this so the first game like what note am i playing so you hold up your finger to signal the note you want them to play everyone push this these fingers down okay now we're gonna play two ready hold have them play. Are they all playing the right note? Good. You've analyzed that. Everyone's played the right note, so they are comfortable with A. Okay. Let's hold up another one. Everyone put those fingers down. Play. Two. Ready. Hold. All right. If you get a wrong note in there, you know that you need to fix something. You need to go through. Maybe one by one. Um, so then have individuals do it. Okay. Everyone, we're playing this. I'm going to go down the row. Point to you. When I point to you, you're going to play this note. Here we go. Da. 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 Uh, okay, fix that one. <laughs> Go and fix that one real quick um, and have everyone just focused in. Have everyone practice playing each one while you fix that note. Spend like 10 to 15 seconds on it. And the other thing that games do, it gives their chops a break because they're not playing continuously and this is brand new for them. So their chops are weak. If they're playing one at a time, they are getting that input of hearing the correct note, hopefully, and Hearing, seeing other students play the, the push down the correct fingering and that's input in their brain too so they're absorbing this information even while they're not playing but still giving their chops a break okay so all about the games okay if any of you were curious what M Hall stood for in the very beginning to Mary had a little lamb that's my go-to beginner one day I'm gonna have to change it because the kids are not gonna know what Mary little what Mary had a little lamb is anymore going to be frozen theme song or something but that's okay we always need to evolve so i like to show the order of mary had a little lamb with numbers first so i have i go through and i go one two three two one 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 and you have them sing they know their voice right their voice is their first instrument so that should be pretty comfortable for them or they can hum it that's totally fine too so lead them through the entire tune by signaling the numbers, have them play it after you sing it. So one, so just hold up your finger and go, and you can make it have some rhythm. Two, one, 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 two, 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 one, one, one. I know what you're thinking. You don't need five to get through this. You can keep it at one. One, two, three, two, one, one, one. Two, two, three, two, one. Now that whole time they were playing, I was going slowly through and just signaling what they were supposed to play. And then you ask them, did anyone recognize this tune? And if they did, they're gonna be so psyched that they just played a tune. Okay, so then from here, you troubleshoot what are they struggling with? Is it the rhythm? Is it the counting? Is it a note in the middle? So then you isolate those small spots within the group and you just practice it and you just practice this in small chunks until you can get through the whole thing by just by just snapping it's very it's very powerful to, they can absorb the music just from hearing you do it and hearing you connect the numbers they're very good with numbers okay and then once the whole group gets through it that's usually uh, pretty close to the end of the beginner clinic. And then all you need to do is have them walk them through taking their horn apart again and encourage them to clean it if they have the correct swab or tell them to get a better swab. And then as they're putting it away, I go over to the kids that need a little extra help and I see what the problem is. I see, I try and figure out what's going on. Um, sometimes their read is like down too much and it's um, too soft or sometimes it's up too far 
Um, yeah, so it's really, it's really all about troubleshooting near the end and just trying to figure out what is uh, going, what is going on. But yeah, so let's see that is really that's the end of what I go through with the students. Um, so just to summarize before I take a couple of questions, uh, keep it simple. I was kind of elaborating for all of you because you're all very highly intelligent and I can see that. Um, but keep it as simple as possible, right? So number one, finger, press down this key. Show them, make sure you see. Um, make it fun. This is fun for you to do. This is fun for you to share. And that will translate. Students connect to the topic you are talking about by connecting to you first. So you need to make yourself open and fun and engaged and enthused. Have lots of games. Like you just saw, everything can become a game. You may not think, you know, it's, it's not Catan, right? But it's definitely an engaging, they, they have to pay attention and they can, you know, it's, it's a fun thing and they get giggles and it's a good time. And create the moments of controlled chaos, okay? I think that's really important. I think controlled chaos is the only way to keep their attention for long amounts of time. You give them very specific moments and a very short window for their energy to just explode for a second. And that is sometimes the most fun part. And then focus on the needs of the student. I remember in my education classes, there was this um, study done that, or there was a study cited to us that teachers take about two years to stop thinking about themselves once they start teaching. So you get into a classroom, you get students, and you're really worried about yourself for the first two years because it's stressful, it can be scary, and it can definitely be, um, you're, you're worried about just a whole variety of things. So the sooner you can turn that awareness onto the student, the sooner that you can be thinking just about the student and what the student needs to succeed, the, the more focused, the better your teaching will be, the more focused on, the, on what the student needs, the more they are going to gain from you. So I know that statistic for two years, you can shorten it if you just really focus on being enthusiastic and finding the fun in it and just scanning the room. What does the student need? What does the student need? Um, and giving them that, okay? So yeah, that is my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and it looks like we got one already. So I'm gonna take a look at that real quick, let's see. Um, considering how many beginner horns make the front F key look similar to the B key, yes. How often do you have to correct the index finger and if there's a student who has trouble remembering which one to push, are there any tricks you have to help? Well, that one can definitely be helped with stickers. <laughs> um, you can either put a sticker on the, the one, so he's talking about this one right here, everyone. You all knew that. Um, mine looks very different, but he's right. Beginner horns will have this one look just like the pearl. So you can put a sticker there. You could even get one of those um, stickers that you can write it on and you can actually write no right there. Or uh, depending on how your student works, maybe you want to put the sticker on the B key so they have to feel for it. That could be a suggestion right there. Okay. What led you to choose B, A, and G as the first two notes and how did you choose, how did you choose the order of B, A, and G? Have you experimented with any other notes or introducing them to a different order? So B, A, and G is so I can get through the melody. Um, even if it's a one-on-one -on -one lesson, I, my goal is to get them through playing Mary Had a Little Lamb at the end of 30 minutes. With an individual, you can do that, this in 30 minutes. Um, and it's less fingers. I know on flute, they really, they, they do differently. So you are holding more keys down so you can hold the flute better. But on saxophone, we have the neck strap. So holding it really isn't the issue. And I think 
connecting it to the numbers is kind of another reason why I've done it as B, A, and G. Yeah, I think I think that's I think that answers it mostly, but happy to talk about it more um, if you have other suggestions. Anyone else? How does your approach change if you are teaching a beginner one on one versus to a group? I think one on one, I'm e I'm able to identify the problems faster and I can even prevent it quicker. So if I see what's happening, for instance, going back to Kevin's uh, question about putting the finger on the wrong key, if I'm like, okay, so you're going to put your fingers on the horn like this, and I see their finger going there, I can just, nope, leave that down. So you can identify problems a lot faster and you can even prevent it. Let's see, I'm not any less fun one-on-one. -on -one. I, I try to be as engaging and as make it as fun as possible. Um, even if it's just one-on-one, -on -one, maybe have to dial down the energy because I don't have a huge room to fill up the space. Uh, let's see, any other changes? I think there can be more. You can actually take more time to play back, back and forth more with the kid because you're going to get through the putting the horn away, getting the mouthpiece hatch on the mouthpiece, getting the ligature on there correctly much quicker one-on-one -on -one. so you can spend more time playing and I think you can even go a little further and I like to do even with beginners I like to get their ears working right away and so I'll play one of those three notes so B, A, or G and I'll say which note was that play it for me at the very end and I'm already getting them to kind of hear what I'm playing and play it back to me and then I do that with the rhythm so I would say they get more time to practice playing the horn at the end if it's a one-on-one -on -one. whereas a group I'm really it's you have to spend time troubleshooting large group problems but I try and make it an individual feel as possible in a large group I hope that answers your question let's see what would you do if a student's horn is completely out of commission during the workshop oh <laughs> I've had this happen before and it's so heartbreaking because once again, a lot of times it's a horn that was given to them by a family friend um, and they haven't had it looked at and that is just a bummer. So a couple of things you can do. You can get a hold of the band director who's running around the hall trying to get you or trying to help out everyone and say, do you have another horn this kid can use today? Or do you have a part that will work better for this kid today? If that's not the case, you can send the kid with the parent to find the band director. Sometimes at these beginner clinics, they will actually have a technician there to troubleshoot these issues with the horn. Sometimes it's the store owners who are renting these horns. They will have their tech person out there for the clinic. This isn't the, the case for everyone, but try and solve the problem. Try and enlist the help of a parent in the room or the band director. And if anything, they can at least participate by singing. It's not the best, but like learning the, thing, the numbers. And then when they get their horn back, they can jump right into it and take those numbers to learning Mary Had a Little Lamb. So yeah, um, let's see. I don't see any more questions. So uh, let's see, I just want to close then unless anyone has anything else, by saying uh, it is about having fun. And I think the way to go about having that fun is in a controlled way. It cannot be chaotic the whole time. Controlled chaos, moments of it. Keep transitions moving. Don't allow any dead time. That's when students disengage from what you're trying to present and that's when problems happen, okay? So thank you so much for being here, I hope. Um, this was helpful and informative, and if you have any other questions, I'm happy to talk to you outside of this. So thank you so much.